and that should work. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming to this last presentation. It's been a great um, series, and we've been so happy to see all the interest. So we're going to talk a little bit about just what next, kind of like covering some things that maybe we didn't talk about yet in terms of birds and the bees of sustainable gardening, talk about local resources. Um, I figured since we had featured some native bees and some native um, birds that we could also feature some native plants in this presentation. So I'd like to um, first acknowledge that I'm working in the unceded traditional territory of the people of the um, Anishinaabe people in Ottawa. Just trying to find my notes. I found another interesting stat here that I wanted to share with you. A fact, apologies. Uh, the nine Algonquin bands are, are in Quebec and there's one Algonquin band in Ontario and they have a combined population of about 11,000. It was estimated that they were 6,000 strong in the 1600s, um, the first contact with Europeans. The Algonquin people call themselves Oma Mi Winnie Ni. And I'd also like to thank um, TDFES, Toronto Dominion Friends of the Environment Foundation. And thanks to their generous funding, we were able to offer this winter webinar outdoor greening series. And I'm just gonna take a quick um, attendance here. I just had two more people come in. Apologies as I don't have uh, someone who is um, also here to help me with that. So I'll be doing that as I go along. All right, just for the people who um, haven't been to another of our webinar um, series this winter, I just thought I'd go quickly over Faith in the Common Good. We're a national organization with local chapters. We have an Ottawa chapter that's um, been here in Ottawa for about 15 years. Now, Faith in the Common Good was founded on the belief that our diverse faith congregations and spiritual communities can be powerful role models for the common good. So we see this green rule that comes up in all uh, different types of spiritual texts, as you can see in the poster there. So our mission is to support diverse faith and spiritual communities that wish to contribute to greener, healthier, more resilient neighborhoods. And we have um, quite a range of uh, environmental care for creation programs. The one that I am running in Ottawa is um, the GSS, the Greening Sacred Spaces Outdoor Greening Program. And um, as with other programs that we have, we have online resources, we have case studies, we have downloadable guides, fact sheets, tip sheets, and um, we also provide annual support, local support to help projects on the ground. And so I will do a quick overview of the presentation for today. I'm just gonna make sure there's no one else. We've got uh, everybody in now. Um, so what we're gonna do is just do go over a quick summary of what we had learned in the, uh, what we had sort of talked about in the last couple of webinars. And then we'll go into the, the new stuff, some new findings, or more like maybe um, some also um, thoughts or studies and things like that, that some people may not be aware of. Um, other gardening tips that weren't covered in the other presentations, or maybe some that we just wanted to review a bit more. And as I mentioned, some favorite native plants, and then um, local resources. So I really wanted to profile those garden signs that we talked a little bit about in a couple of the other presentations. So I wanted to show you what um, options there were if you wanted to sign, um, put up sign up in your property, and then the local resources. So in terms of the first three webinars, I mean, in the first one, we talked about the five W's, you know, why we're doing it, where we're doing it, who's doing it. Um, Faith in the Common Good has some really great resources. So we have those 10 fact sheets online, free to download on sustainable gardening. And that really helps you with that what and the how. Uh, the other thing to take away was really to consider what sustainability means. You know, it's always for us to kind of look at what we're doing and consider what is a closed loop system. How can we make our actions a bit more sustainable, more environmental, you know, with every um, thing that we do in the garden, every purchase. You know, if we take a couple of minutes and really consider what we're doing and if there are alternatives, you know, this can really help make some changes. And then, as I mentioned in the first webinar, we highlighted 10 birds to help profile sort of what the birds are looking for in terms of habitat, environment, and how we can help them in that way. 
And then the second one, we talked about native pollinators and the new resource that Wild Pollinator Partners, uh, which is in Eastern Ontario, had created for faith communities. And then we profiled 10 of our native bee species and what they, again, need in the habitat to, to thrive, you know, such as dirt, mud, the native plants, um, even water, um, and also to highlight the need for eliminating chemicals as much as possible because they are affected by neonicotinoids and other pesticides. And then we had um, Sarah Colbert come um, to give us a wonderful overview of what is needed in a wildlife friendly garden. It's, she really helped sort of profile all the species of bees and wasps and flies, like just how many there are that you know, we're probably just not aware of going you know, through our daily lives. And I really find that the CWF certification program is such a great initiative. And I'm really hoping you know, that inspires you and that maybe more faith communities consider working towards this. You know, it's about that food, water, and shelter for those animals. So now we're going to go on to new findings. Um, so some of these you might have sort of seen in headlines, but we'll just do a little bit of a, a feature for them. So the first one is leaf blowers. So this was in Germany. Uh, leaf blowers are not only deafeningly loud and pollute the air through their internal combustion engines, but they also harm the soil bio biology. And then in addition to leaves, they um, suck up insects and spiders and chop them up and plant seeds are also destroyed. So, and this was kind of where that first insect Armageddon headline came out of. There was a, a study um, that was released in about 2017 that showed that flying insect numbers in 60 protected sites across Germany had fallen by more than 75% in the last 30 years. And then there are other studies in other countries that were now sort of shown to be collaborating those numbers. And so because of these studies, the German government is looking at um, ways to um, alleviate these issues in any way they can, including leaf blowers. So and in terms of leaf blowers, you also want to consider, like they said, how loud they are. They can be as loud as 90 to 120 decibels, which is as loud as a hel helicopter taking off or a jackhammer being operated. And then most leaf blowers are two-stroke engines. So that's just like your gas lawnmowers. And in the Ontario, um, in 2005, Ontario government re released a stat that stated that one hour of using a two-stroke engine, such as a lawnmower, can be as polluting as driving a car 550 kilometers. So it's really not, um, it's not something that we want to be using anymore, these two-stroke engines. Um, so I highlighted spiders there because I had uh, worked in the landscaping industry for one summer and um, I'm fascinated a bit by spiders, um, all, like all the different types of insects. And I really obviously was down on the ground and really got to see and notice these spiders. The company did not use leaf blowers. So um, we did a lot of raking in the fall. Um, but the one thing that I was concerned about was just all that plant material that was, be take, that was being taken off properties and you know, thrown into leaf bags and thrown um, to the compost. So this is a lot of um, pollen, nectar, um, habitat for insects, and it's also insects that are on these um, leaves and on the plants that are being put into leaf bags. And especially in the fall, I really noticed a lot of spiders. Um, so I would shake off all the hosta leaves because that was one of the big things that we were clearing up in, on many properties, shaking them off, making sure the spiders didn't get into the leaf bags and even looking into the leaf bags, you know, a couple of minutes later and you know, trying to help any spiders that were trying to get out. So just in case um, anybody has some phobia about spiders, so the next slide has a uh, a picture of spiders. Um, so, and I can tell you when we uh, turn to the next slide. So I'll show you the spider. So I saw a lot of these wolf spiders that, you know, were carrying their egg sacs uh, along with them. And um, what many people uh, might not realize is that they also carry their babies on themselves. Also, you can sort of see, I don't think it was for very long because I've never seen that, but they are carrying their babies also. So it definitely made me uh, connect a lot with these wolf spiders. So I will take that picture off. And so the next thing we're going to talk about is um, a headline that actually came out in 2009, but I think it's really important to still highlight it. So green patches. So if you know, especially if you're in a faith community, these type of, you know, spaces could perhaps be a little bit of a rest stop 
for birds if there's a bit more space. Sometimes it's harder if you're looking at your residential um, backyard, but it's something to think about. So green patches they noticed were really important um, in terms of migrating birds. And we did talk about that stat that uh, for urban areas, they harbor 20% of world bird species. So it's definitely an important space for birds and where we should be trying to protect them. So uh, these two studies, um, one was um, where they actually released birds in urban patches of various sizes and then monitored them to see if they would stay in that rest stop um, or leave rather quickly. So this study actually showed that a majority of the birds stayed at even the smallest sites. So 0 0.7 hectares, uh, 4.5 hectares, um, which suggested that as long as the type of bird was somewhat flexible in habitat needs and able to meet their stepover requirements, they stayed there. So some of their needs could be insects, could be berries, and they definitely benefited from these small green patches. And they also kind of monitored um, how long they stayed. So some would stay from one to 12 days. The average was around four days. So if you think about 0 0.7 hectares, your typical suburban lot is about 0 0.6 hectares. So imagine what could be done if a few neighbors got together or you, know, you were sort of backing onto a park with a, you know, a little bit of a wooded lot. Or we could think about, as I mentioned, like our faith communities or campuses in a bit of a different way, adding some more shrubs and vines and some of that really important uh, native habitat. Um, and I wanted to mention like Ottawa, our urbanized area, we have, I was looking at the map and uh, we noticed at least two 10 hectare wooded spots. Now 10 hectares is the smallest size that some ecologists say that there is definitely some dense inner forest. So you have to have a certain, you know, um, uh, distance circumference. And um, inside the green belt, I, I noticed that there were two. Um, so it is hard to get those um, larger wooded dense areas, but as the study shows, it's not as important when they're migrating. So the other study um, was looked at 47 greenways in North Carolina, and it turned out that most birds weren't picky, and they would stop at just about any greenway, um, regardless of vegetation, land use, um, beside it, or quarter width. But not all greenways were entirely equal, so birds favored quarters with taller trees and more native shrubs, so that had fruit. So again, we want to think of that habitat um, for birds. Now, uh, another new finding that came out, this is one study. It was a study in Guelph um, for 18 farms, but it has um, pretty severe um, uh, details uh, results there. So they said that the team found that, whoops, sorry, go back there. I'm flipping through too many things here. The team found that um, a hoary squash bee was exposed to a killing dose of neonicotinoids 80% of the time. And um, that was at 18 farms. So 60% of these neonicotinoids are applied through seed coatings or by um, soil applications, and the residue can persist in the environment for years. And they found that um, the pollen and nectar of bees, they found these pesticides in the pollen and nectar of bees um, as both adults and as larvae. And we have to remember that 99% of our bees do not make honey. So we really wanna be thinking of all these native species that are at risk and that need our help. Um, for um, birds, again, it's a little bit similar to the last point, but ecotones um, are important. So these are these transitional areas. So there's always this greater value placed on certain ecological habit habitats, such as wetlands, forests, grasslands. And we also uh, want to think about ecotones, these transitional areas, because they are really important. So these areas are like scrublands. They're considered edges where the two habitats will overlap. So that means that not only there are flora species from both of these habitats in the overlapping areas, but there also then would be the fauna species that are supported by the flora. So we really want to recognize that they have a higher biodiversity and again, value these types of shrubby areas. Now in urban um, areas, they can be seen as dangerous, you know, where wildlife could be or other dangerous species could hide. But we wanna be able to 
counteract this belief or you know do some things to to make it um okay to have these spaces there whether it's a little bit more you know lit or um something in terms of you know a distance from any areas that we would be um, walking around so we want to understand that um forested areas are also more protected if there's a gradual transition these shrubs that surround the perimeter rather than that abrupt change from like say forest to just grass and then as faith communities um, or property owners there could be an opportunity to add you know a couple of shrubs um, some hedges or hedgerow um, and you know if you're uh, faith community properties in the suburbs you know perhaps there's a bit of room for or a small woodlot so it's just one of those things to keep in mind when we're looking at our properties and landscapes so uh, another interesting study was that native bees were doing a really good job of pollination. So this is a recent study, 2019. So they did a study, I think it yeah, three years, um, commercial pumpkin growers. So they will routinely rent honeybees, um, but a study of three years has shown that the wild bees can do just as good of a job. So they're looking at the honeybees, um, they're looking at um, squash bees, and these bees need to visit a female flower about 8 to 15 times to accomplish pollination. But bumblebees uh, can do it with half the visits, and that's because the bumblebees, you know, have that extra fuzzy body that buzz pollination. And um, it, you know, leaves more pollen behind. So the study found that when they multiplied the number of visit times, um, and how much pollen that was being deposited, they were really blown away to find that bumblebees and squash bees combined were doing more than 10 times the pollination that was necessary. So that's an interesting thing to consider also. Um, I found, I think I'll just have to go back here, here. The other thing that I was really found interesting was this um, point here, flowers respond to pollinator sounds. Um, within minutes by increasing nectar sugar concentration. I just found that kind of like an interesting fact. So they did a study and they do think it's the vibration of the sound that um, communicates with the flower and then there's increased sugars that they see in the flower when the, the sound of a flying bee is nearby. So mosquitoes, mosquitoes are pollinators too. So mosquitoes have many functions in the ecosystem and uh, these are overlooked. So indiscriminate mass elimination would impact everything from pollination, surprisingly, to biomass transfer. So again, as we are learning, there's like so many species of mosquitoes. I, I have this thought here, 3,500 mosquito species and many that don't bite humans. And then of course, as we, no, the species that do bite is only females that do, and they only do it when they're developing their eggs. But you know, every time you go out, it seems like the mosquitoes are biting. So the fundamental food of all adult mosquitoes is plant sugar, and that's from nectar. So it definitely is this uh, pollination is an overlooked uh, ecological function of mosquitoes. Um, they're definitely key pollinators in northern climates, um, along with flies. And uh, it's possibly because they're more crespular, so they're seen, you know, at, at, uh, come out sort of more in, in dusk and things like that. So we may not be observing that they're doing a lot of pollination. And then, of course, in terms of that biomass transfer, mosquito larvae are also um, are not only really important in terms of aquatic um, systems, but also in terms of when they're adults and they're consumed by birds, really important for bats, you know, frogs, and even other insects. So there was a stat that says um, mosquito biomass has been calculated at 96 million pounds in Alaska alone. And, you know, there is that consideration because mosquitoes are a very deadly animal, you know, they can um, spread pathogens. So we really want to figure out how to maintain the ecosystem function of mosquitoes while reducing disease burden. So um, we need to either target specific species, um, making mosquitoes immune to pathogens perhaps, you know, something that we uh, might wanna think about um, to make uh, mosquitoes um, easier to live with. Um, urban beekeeping, I just wanted to add a few facts about urban beekeeping. Um, you know, it's a new and expanding business area, so um, it's definitely getting a lot of uh, focus now in the media. Um, but there is some concern um, by ecolog 
ecologists and scientists um, who are keen to help endangered native species, they're a little bit concerned about some of the bee washing that's been happening in terms of urban beekeeping businesses. So I don't know if some people are familiar with green washing. So that's, um, you know, when businesses will mislead the public um, about the environmental benefits of a product, and then it ends up putting the onus on consumer to educate themselves. So I just thought we'd do a little bit of education here so that we can really understand the pros and cons. So there is that difference between a domesticated livestock, which is the honeybee, and the wild native bee. So honeybees do not add any urban biodiversity resilience. And in Canada, they do not need habitat because they're a European species. There is no habitat in Canada for them. So there's this um, sort of a message that, um, you know, urban bees help with habitat or and things like that. But that's um, it's not a truth. So urban beekeeping companies, the other concern is that they're adding these non-native bees to our urban and suburban landscapes, but they don't add um, any more flowers. So you've got more bees, you know, your European honeybee and your native bees, and just the same number of flowers. So that food source that all, that all bees are looking for. And we want to consider, you know, the 400 wild bee species that we have in Ontario and their, um, their real risk for these wild bees of losing habitat. Now, for in terms of education, there's a really great article um, for Nature Conservancy and the Cornell Lab. So it's, uh, do honeybees compete with native bees? So you can uh, do a Google search for that. And you know, really there at the end of the day, it's, you know, they, they do point out that it's complicated. There are pros and cons. Um, but a couple of things that they pointed out were that honeybees can transfer diseases to native bees, and they do sometimes outcompete wild bees. And the other thing that we want to think about, um, you know, as we were mentioning in terms of ground dwelling bees and all of the neonicotinoids in agricultural areas outside of the city. Um, so those um, habitats, if you will, but they're monocultures, so they're not the greatest anyway, but those are not a good refuge for our native bees. So cities really may be an important refuge away from these pesticides, you know, especially some cities are banning pesticides. So again, this is a great place for ground dwelling bees to um, have habitat. Uh, we're also still learning about foraging ranges. So we're not sure, you know, in terms of um, how far a native bee can go to find um, nectar, you know, if, it, if it's too much for it to go in certain areas. Um, some of them are more um, specialized, so they're looking for certain flowers. And we want to keep in mind that um, uh, native bees, you know, and this example is native bumblebees, they are at risk of extinction, so 25% of our native bumblebees. Um, whereas the European honeybee is not at risk of going extinct because they are a managed species. And the global stock of Europe European honeybees are rising. So we're lucky here in Ottawa because we do have a couple of laws that um, you know, make it um, um, uh, not permitted to have urban bees in the city. So um, beekeeping is considered an agricultural use, and so that is not allowed in urban areas. And also the Ontario Bee Act um, requires that beehives are 30 meters away from any adjoining property. So it's about 100 feet. So if you think about um, residential areas, you know, with 100 feet, foot frontage, um, it would be very difficult for a residential person to have an urban beehive on their property. And this is um, you know, what the concern is, that there are a lot of urban beekeeping companies that want to see beehives on you know, every rooftop. And it might be better, you know, it would be very difficult to do, but you know, if the city or city of Ottawa, for example, you know, gave out permits like they give out permits for food trucks and they, they you know, permit a certain number of beehives for each neighborhood and just that amount you know, in a city. Um, this is quite a lot, as you can see, in terms of uh, beehives in Montreal. So that was in September. And now back to birds. So, oops, sorry, I keep doing that. I'm trying to go to my other page here. Yeah, there we go. So migrating birds can be collateral damage for popular pesticides. So the neonicotinoids that we've been talking about a lot can be uh, partly responsible for declines in um, songbird populations. Um, so that also, uh, it delays migration because of 
weight loss and perhaps disorientation that they're seeing in captive birds. And they say, saw sort of similar things, body mass loss and extended stopovers when they released the birds. So, and the concern there is that because migration is so finely tuned, body mass loss and extended stop over time can have um, really impacting effects. Um, a delay, they said in the study, of just three and a half days may not be, may not sound like much, but it's huge to a bird. Um, songbirds are vulnerable to predators at night um, when postponements occur, and then they can find it harder to mate and find it harder to find quality nesting sites at the end of the journey if they have those delays. So again, we really want to um, not be using any pesticides and maybe perhaps even considering buying more organics. And one last new finding um, that was up in headlines this year was light pollution. Now this might be harder to um, really address in the larger sense because we have so many street lights. Um, but um, artificial light at night, uh, in combination with those other factors, does seem to be driving insect decline. So this is after they assessed 150 studies. So they felt that um, this was another reason that there was such a collapse in insect species. So this could be street lights to gas flares from oil extraction. There's just so much light at night now. Um, you know, there's that familiar moth flapping around a bulb, um, mistaking that for the moon. One third of insects trapped in the orbit of such lights die before morning, uh, either through exhaustion or being eaten. So some thoughts were, you know, shading light. So only the area that's needed is illuminated. Um, avoiding blue-white lights, which interfere with daily rhythms. And LED lights can also offer ho hope because they can easily um, be tuned to avoid harmful colors and flicker rates. So now we're gonna go on to gardening tips. So I think we talked a little bit about rainwater in um, one of the presentations, but rainwater is really great for your garden. It's highly oxygenated. It's also at the ambient air temperature, so it doesn't shock plants. And um, there aren't any unnecessary chemicals like our city water, including like fluorides and things like that. And watering from the ground is best. So there's less loss of water um, in terms of watering from the ground. So uh, no evaporation from the leaves. And also plants don't get wet. Sometimes, you know, they'll be saying that you shouldn't be watering, you know, in late afternoon and evening because um, wet plants, you know, with the temperature ops can then be affected by that. Um, irrigation hose, you know, watering from the ground is better than sprinklers. Sprinklers, especially for bees, can mimic rain. And when it does rain, bees will stop pollinating. They don't want to be wet. They don't want to get cold. So um, if you can, in your backyard, use something else other than a sprinkler, that it would be great in terms of um, bees. Another thought in terms of gardens, think of your uh, backyard, your property, in terms of um, permaculture principles. So um, if you're familiar with permaculture, they have different zones that radiate out from the you know, house or the main spot in the center. So always think about that zone zero, which is right beside your house. And in terms of accessing um, plants, um, tools, things that you would be using more daily, you want to always have in that zone zero. I can't remember how far it goes out, but you know, the further out, you know, the zone, it's more wild. So you don't, you're not visiting that area as much, but you want to think of your um, zones as layers um, in terms of rating it out from your house. So permaculture also thinks about natural cycles and how you can maximize those cycles from nature to do the work for you. So slopes in terms of creating sort of wetter areas, depressions, so you don't have to water as much, you know, windbreaks that can create um, microclimates or warm south facing walls that can also create microclimates. So you wanna think about those. Now, this one was um, about um, man, um, built materials. So those um, uh, things like that we create, like the mason bee boxes and the bird houses, um, we really wanna consider how much time these take because they do take um, upkeep. Uh, 
and maintenance, um, at least yearly, if not more than yearly. You know, for example, even bird feeders, they need to be cleaned regularly so we're not passing diseases from birds to other birds. So I always just like thinking of my garden as, you know, what's providing um, all those resources to wildlife and um, not sort of adding to my daily task to do list. But, you know, just always consider that before you um, start doing these things like mason bee boxes they really have to be cleaned out every year they can't be reused um, so think about that when you're using these types of products um, provide natural materials instead like hollow stems so certain plants will have hollow stems that can be used by bees for laying eggs rock piles brush piles things like that so it's always that um, discussion of making things a little bit more messy perhaps in corners where you can't see them as much makes things easier for the gardener and um, there, there is some really good news about neonicotinoids. Um, the Friends of the Earth report does show that um, most of the major nurseries across Canada are thinking about that, are doing steps to eliminate that in the next you know, couple of years, um, a certain time period that they're working towards. But you know, if in doubt, always ask. Like I was at a nursery last year and I asked about two specific uh, brands of plants that they had that were native plants and they, um, took my email, they asked the um, supplier, and then they got back to me in terms of what, what kind of chemicals were being used on those plants. So it, it is something that you can get information on. Now the Friends of Earth report on their website, uh, you know, lists all, all those nurseries and what their statement was in terms of where they are in that process of elim eliminating neonicotinoids. So home hardware, Loblaws, and some of the actual larger and nurseries, um, plant nurseries. So that's a good um, report to look at. And then as um, we heard in the last uh, presentation, you know, we're always going to think of food, shelter, and water. Um, for different sizes of um, wildlife. So, you know, we talked about bee dishes, you know, there's bird baths, you know, on different types of ways to provide water to wildlife, um, food to wildlife, etc. Hedgerows, hedgerows, which we um, heard a little bit about, you know, from Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, it's interesting, it's always uh, good to think about mixing those hedgerows. Like sometimes it looks nice to have a uniform hedgerow of the, all the same plant, but that mixed variety really provides such a much more um, benefit to wildlife. You want to think uh, in threes. So you want to think of some shrubs that provide thorns, some shrubs that provide nuts, and some shrubs that provide berries. And better if they all are flowering at different times of the year, so they can also provide pollen and nectar at different times. And then you can even um, you know, intersperse some vines in with those shrubs and create such a, like a little biodiverse area um, that's so beneficial for wildlife. And the last uh, thing that I thought we should think about, you know, Doug Talamay's book has come out and he is again talking about the homegrown national park that he, you know, was talking about uh, in 2015 or 14, I think when his last book came out. So the stat then was that in the US, 45.6 million acres of lawn in uh, America, and it grows by about 500 square miles every year. So if um, those acreages of lawn were turned into native plants, uh, shrubs, flowers, um, that could be a homegrown national park. And he, you know, was also talking about something that ecologists are always talking about, those biological corridors that really connect isolated habitat fragments and, you know, build in resilience when you have um, more diversity in wildlife. Let's check the times, 7.35, so that looks good. Um, so the last tip, um, you know, this is um, from that Native Bee um, website, doing less is often the best way to conserve wild native bees, which is great news. You know, mowing less, tidying your garden less, applying less pesticides, all these things. We don't need to purchase things for to support wild native bees. We actually have to do less. So that's a great um, news. So now we'll go on to native plants. So I divided these native plants um, by spring, summer, and fall. And uh, let me see, I'm gonna try to highlight some in terms of you know whether they're um, good for birds or bees or both. Um, 
And just a quick confession, uh, most of my garden is like part shade. Um, it gets a lot of morning light and a little bit of afternoon light that kind of rolls across the backyard. Um, so I feel kind of lucky, which is a, maybe a strange thing for a gardener to say, but I find that the part shade really makes it a little bit easier again for me to garden. Like I don't have to worry about plants taking over as quickly. Um, I think, you know, sometimes they're, they get, uh, the sunny ones, you know, can expand so fast, but I find that in my shade garden, some plants that people kind of say, oh, I don't like that plant, um, you know, because it takes over. And I'm like, oh, it does, it does not take over in my shade garden. So something to consider is, you know, looking at those uh, part shade areas and using them to um, as much as you can. So willows, um, you know, trees, but also shrubs are uh, amazing um, spring flowering plants that um, birds, I'm uh, sorry, birds, and well, really mostly Bees, insects, and then of course birds looking for those insects really benefits from, and these willow shrubs will grow very fast. So consider the size that it's supposed to grow into. Also, if you're gonna put some willows into your yard. Canada anemone is something that I really love. I haven't put into my garden yet, um, but it does do well in sun and sort of part shade. It has its long bloom, and it also has a really unique, interesting seed head afterwards, so it can really add quite an interesting um, look to the garden. Uh, wild geranium, it expands kind of like um, a hosta, so it doesn't sort of pop up as much as sort of slowly expand from the middle. Um, it does well in part shade, so it's great for insects. And violets, now I wouldn't recommend it um, for anyone who wants to have a lawn, but um, my backyard was a lawn with some violets in it, and now it's basically a garden with violets in it. Um, so they do really well, they transplant really well, they do well in part shade, and, um, and they're just, I think they look great in the spring. Red columbine is another plant that sort of um, reseeds itself, and it's a great plant for insects, and um, it's good in the shade. And then berry shrubs. So berry shrubs are great, um, both in terms of pollen and nectar for insects, but also they're great for birds. So, you know, your raspberries, your plums, um, your gooseberries, your blueberries, and even some trees, some smaller trees like crab apples, service berries, cherries, those are um, magnets for wildlife. So in terms of severed plants, I have two slides for that. Um, Golden Alexander is more of a plant that's good for part shade, but it really provides those yellows um, in early summer. And then you have the monardas. So you have the bee balms, the bergamots, there's even one called a spotted bee balm. Uh, and of course the monardas, you know, some do better in full sun, some do better in part sun. So they are a good plant to put, so that you put in no matter what your garden um, sun uh, quantities are. And they also do um, bloom for longer periods. Now milkweed, um, we want to um, you know, uh, consider what type of milkweed we wanna put in. I put a common milkweed in my front yard, which is uh, the one sunny spot that I do have. And it's really taking over and I kind of regret putting it in there. Um, I have heard from gardeners that, you know, swamp milkweed might do better. It, again, it, um, it's, it grows slower and also, the orange butterfly weed, um, which you know is one that kind of grows out rather than sort of popping up as much. And the butterfly weed um, can even bloom twice. Um, these are drought tolerant. They do have tap roots, so they're great in terms of that. And some of them do have hollow stems, so they're also a benefit in terms of that also. But when you're looking for butterfly weed, which is one of the milkweeds, make sure it's not a butterfly bush, um, which I have there. That's not native to Ontario. Cup plant um, is another really interesting tall plant. Um, it's great. It provides a little bit of water for birds and insects also. Um, and I think it does like more full sun. I don't have one of those, but um, I've seen it in uh, other gardens and it looks great. And then the Black Eyed Susan is another just kind of um, popular plant. It reseeds itself. So you can have the Black Eyed Susan or the Brown Eyed Susan. And I think, and one of them does a bit better in less sun. I think it's the Brown Eyed Susan one. Um, evening Primrose. Um, so this is more of, uh, donation plant, uh, a plant that kind of just comes into your yard. Um, it was um, uh, valued um, 
earlier on, but not valued as much anymore. But if you are lucky to have evening primrose, it's um, very popular with insects and also with birds. Uh, blue vervain is uh, another great plant not seen in a lot of gardens. It likes sun. Um, it's great for insects and it has those smaller flowers, so great for smaller insects also. And some of your more um, well-known um, wild flowers, the hyssops, the panstamens, liatris, and the coreopsis, which is the tick seed. Some of those are great for birds if you keep the seed heads up, like the liatris and the tick seed, and all of those are great for insects. And another one that's great for insects and birds is the native clematis. It's also known as virgin's bower. It's a vine, um, but it can take over a little bit, so you want to watch it. And also Virginia creeper is amazing in terms of providing fruit for birds, you know, in uh, late fall, even in winter, but it can also take over, so you want to think about that before you put it in. And in the fall, um, as many of you probably have heard, asters and goldenrod. Another one um, is sneezeweed, um, which I do like to see sort of late summer and early fall. But the goldenrods and asters are great because they are um, very, there's quite a few species of them. And you can find species that can do well in drier spots, in sunnier spots, in shadier spots. There are so there are quite a few varieties, and you um, just want to find the ones that work in your property. The one I would uh, not recommend is the Canada goldenrod because it can be a bit of a bully, especially in sunny spots. It also produces a chemical that kind of um, eliminates other plants from being able to sort of really do well in the soil. Also, so Canada goldenrod is not on my list. Um, zigzag, I do have a bunch of it in my backyard. I started from one plant and I see so many bees on it in the fall, along with asters. A panicle aster moved into my backyard or probably was already in my backyard when I started. And it's great to transplant, easy to transplant. And those numbers that you see there, and it's just butterfly and moss species, but those um, two plants are all one of the ones that have a quite a higher number of um, insect species that they support compared to uh, lots of other uh, flowers. So your goldenrods and asters are, are really important to quite a few species. And then, um, as some of you know, I thought it'd be fun just to talk about, you know, some of my favorite smaller plants. I think I've mentioned a couple of these before, um, but mosses, um, I'm always transplanting my moss. Um, mosses are forests to very, very small creatures. So I'm always thinking of that in terms of when I'm transplanting moss and moving it. Um, Blue-eyed grass, you know, supports those smaller uh, bees and insects. Daisy fleabane um, was noted um, by um, uh, a well-known um, website um, that is important in terms of the um, smaller food chain side of ecosystem. Sangfoy again also and Yarrow have those smaller um, flowers. So you know thinking about the range of um, flower sizes and then I just wanted to highlight um, the double flower heads um, provide little or no pollen. And I'm always, uh, you know, thinking it's great to mix some annuals with the perennials, but you know, just keeping that in mind, you know, your roses, your camellias, your marigolds, your carnations, don't provide that pollen for pollinators. So I wanted to get into garden signs. It's about a quarter or two, so I might go through this a little quickly. Um, we talked about this a bit before. Um, in terms of why garden signs are great. And really it's that certification program. So getting your garden certified um, provides you with this goal and a lot of these organizations will also offer you steps in terms of um, how to do the certification online. And it's always great to get your certificate or to have your sign to celebrate your achievement. And when you register, this also provides stats to those organizations. So it's great in terms of for them to collect this information about like say how many way station, monarch way stations there are, how many people are gardening for bees. And then if you do put up the sign, I think we've talked about before, it helps with um, educating the neighborhood and providing a bit of advocacy for um, wildlife. So the first one we talked about before, so that's Wild Pollinator Partners, and they're in Ottawa. 
Um, they focus on insect pollinators. So this is not a really certification. They just have signs that um, if you want to put them out, um, they're free and it helps with that education and advocacy for wild pollinators. So they have the four versions of the sign. So these you would print out in color and laminate and then they you can put them on a core class and then put them on, a, on some stakes. Um, they're great in terms of, you know, the color can really bring attention to them and you can choose a, a different message. And um, we're putting those up in a faith community properties. So the other one that we've already heard about is the Canadian Wildlife Federation Backyard Habitat Certification Program. And this is great. It focuses on all wildlife, including birds and bees. And um, the up application is online. So you would upload some photos, perhaps even a garden plan. Um, they really want to see you know, um, information about food and the water and the shelter. And they do have those resources online to help you um, identify what you should have in your garden. And then they have two versions of the sign. And I think that Sarah shared that with us, but I also have them here. So there's no cost to certify, but there is an extra cost to the sign. And I wasn't able to get the cost of them um, but if you're interested we can get information from Sarah and then there's a couple others so there's the monarch watch it's a North American program they focus on the monarch they have just one version of their sign their certification application is online and it's um, they ask for a size of habitat um, the density of your flowers which provides that shelter for monarchs what host and what native plants you have, and then the sustainable management practices that you would be using. So they have this downloadable free how to create a waste station guide online, which is great. And there is a cost to register. So it's $16 US and then the signs are an extra 17 US. And then there is their sign. Now the North American Butterfly Association also has um, signs for butterflies. So they have two versions of their sign and their certification um, process includes um, giving information about caterpillar food, uh, nectar sources, and that you are not using pesticides. So many of these uh, website site resources um, are online in terms of creating butterfly gardens. And then their certification is free but the signs are extra. So you might want to do the monarch garden. So they'll ask you if you have milkweed and or just a butterfly garden. And they'll ask you for the plants that you have. So the Xerces Society um, does a pledge. So this is not really a certification of your garden, but if you do apply online, they can um, add your garden to their million pollinator garden challenge. So they are interested in uh, knowing about your garden. So there's the pledge of having pollinator friendly flowers, nest site, not using pesticides, and then also spreading the word. And they have these, a really interesting resource center that's actually a section by region. So we'd look at the Great, Lake, Great Lakes region. Uh, and the application again is free. But the sign, which they do have a sign for your garden, is $56. So that's the pollinator habitat sign. And then the last one, they used to have a sign and a certification program, but I can't find it anymore. But they still have um, information online. And they also have a list of bee-friendly blooms. So on their website, they have um, four areas. Be supportive, which is about your gardening practices, um, looking for seeds, keeping things messy, and then preparing for frost. So that's preparing your plants for the winter. And now we'll just talk about local resources. So in Ottawa, we're really lucky to have um, a few gardens here. So we have the Fletcher Wildlife Garden, the Canadian Wildlife Federation Garden. Um, and as we know from the last presentation, they have a great website in terms of resources also. And then the first Unitarian Garden also um, in uh, the West End. All three of these gardens have signs. The first two have native plants. Now the Canadian Wildlife Garden has plants from all over Canada. So it's not just seeing, showing you what's native to Ontario, but it's great to see sort of what's native to Canada. And they have two different sections like a wildflower meadow. They have sort of a mountain, you know, sort of like that uh, higher elevation, I think you'd call it, um, plants and things like that. The first Unitarian garden does have a mix of ornamental and native, but there's some great signs in there. And then of course we have Barrett's a corner pollinator garden, I think, and she puts out pamphlets. And I think you can also download the pamphlet from her blog. 
And the organizations that we have in Ottawa, we have uh, Wild Pollinator Partners, which you've already talked about a lot. Now we have this Society of Organic Urban Land Care. So these are actually landscapers who are interested in approaching uh, land care in a different way, in an organic way. So they have uh, great resources online. And then we've also already talked a bit about Friends of the Earth that have some gardening information, also the plant list and um, information about the neonicotinoids. And then the Ontario Invasive Plant Council has this great pamphlet that's called Grow Me Instead. So they provide information on um, native plants that you could buy instead of some of the more popular like nursery plants um, that people do buy that sometimes can be invasive if they get, um, if they escape into the wild. And then a database that I've been using quite a lot is the Illinois Wildflower Database. Um, this shows the, um, correlation between flora and fauna. So what fauna, what insects, what animals are um, using um, these plants as food and other. So it's really interesting to see that. I also find that horticultural societies and garden clubs in the last like three or four years, uh, they've been um, thinking about sustainable gardening, native gardening. They have at least one or two presentations on that uh, every year. So as you can see, the Ottawa Horticultural Society had a Honey, I Shrunk the Lawn um, lecture. Um, they also are talking about growing more butterflies and that's actually by creating butterfly gardens. Um, the master gardeners of Otto Carlton talk about organic gardening. That's one that's coming up. The rest of these are all coming up. We have a native plants in the garden for old Ottawa South Garden Club. Uh, climate change in your garden in Gloucester. And then um, gardening for birds from Friends of the Farm. So definitely take a look at um, the um, calendars for the horticultural societies. Another local resource, you know, for seeds and plants is actually CD um, Saturday, which actually was just last week, but um, I'm sure there are some people who are still around that are selling seeds. Um, I think uh, Greta's there. No, she's in the next slide. So Greta's Organic um, Garden organized it, so they might be able to help with some um, resources in terms of collecting, getting seeds also. The Fletcher plant sale is in June. That's another great place to find native plants. We have um, a uh, native uh, nursery called Beaux Arbes in Quebec. And then Make It Green has a good selection of native plants now, and they are an organic nursery that's out in the West End. The Canadian Wildlife Federation offers their native plant packs every spring, and you really want to look for those um, in May because they do sell out quickly. So probably by mid-June, you won't be able to find them anymore. And then another, um, it's not as local, but I find that Wildflower Farm is a great um, place uh, to get seeds. They're further north than another uh, nursery that some people might be using um, to get seeds, native seeds. Um, they're further north there, north of uh, Barrie. It's a little bit closer to sort of Ottawa temperatures. And then for food crops, um, we have, you know, Just Food Farm and their community garden uh, program. So they offer funding and other support. They'll come out and visit um, properties for to talk about community gardens. The Canadian Organic Growers has this great organic um, series, um, learning series every spring. They have hosted it in Ottawa before, but I think they're gonna be moving it to different cities, but they may be offering that online. So um, more seeds, you can purchase seeds at Tucker House. So that's in Rockland. They offer heritage um, food crop seeds along with Greta's Organic Gardens. And I don't know if other people have um, some other local resources that they want to share, um, but that is really it. So I think um, we've covered quite a lot tonight. If there's any questions, I don't see any yet. Um, but um, some of the final thoughts is, you know, really consider being a wild beekeeper. Um, you know, think about the ecology that's around you. Even think about sort of what's close by. Like, is there a green space that's close by? Are there uh, wildlife that's moving through your property? We really want to adjust our thinking to living with and cohabitation. So I really see that as, you know, thinking um, of how we can care for creation and how we can have a healthier planet. So 
Thank you so much. This is a, a really wonderful to have been able to offer this series to you. I just want to make sure that I have everybody on this list. So I'm just adding Barrett and I have Carol and Janice and Lori. And I thought I saw one other person. Jen is there. And then John. No, I have everybody. That is wonderful. So and then I'm looking at this. And um, so we have two last prizes and um, just seeing if we have any more questions. Oh, I have here a question. Is it okay to support beehives for honey? Um, I, as I mentioned, it's really good to read that one um, presentation, um, presentation article online. Um, like there, there really is, there are more questions than answers. And um, I, I think the bigger concern is um, having quite a few urban beehives and um, just making sure that um, bee companies are providing the correct information and that you know each um, organization property that's considering having a beehive knows all the pros and cons and can weigh them. Like I know that uh, the National Cemetery here in Ottawa has urban beehives also. So, you know, they are starting um, to be um, some beehives in Ottawa. There's probably more than, you know, we realize, but we just want to think about that. You know, if we do start hearing that there's quite a few, um, we may want to consider whether, you know, we want to have one ourselves. So it's just something to think about. Um, and where can we buy the Canadian Wildlife Federation native plant packs? I saw them last year at Richie's and I think they were at, um, I don't want to say Canadian Tire, Lowe's. They were at Lowe's last year. But Canadian Wildlife Federation says that they will, um, the information about where to buy them will be on their website. And I'll uh, make sure that I send that out in the newsletter. So if you um, are part of our um, newsletter subscription, you'll get that information, but it will also be on the Canadian Wildlife Federation. Um, so that is it. Um, but I, I'm just trying to think, I, in terms of the people that have already won a, a prize, we have Jen, who's from Ottawa, and we have Anna, and everyone else has received one. So um, if I can contact Jen and Anna afterwards, um, then um, we can provide you with those prizes. So congratulations. Um, really? I can't believe it. <laughs> yes, there you go, Anna. You, you get one also. Anna. So yeah, I just wanted to know. mention, I noticed that it's almost eight o'clock, but um, we'll have these um, webinar recordings up and available online. So if you've missed one, um, I'll send you the link to everyone who's signed up. And as I mentioned, also send you the link to our um, Interfaith Gardening newsletter. So that will provide you with um, information about gardening every spring. And especially if you're gardening with your faith community, it'll provide you information about uh, programs such as like free native plants and things like that. Um, and then, of course, there's our online program, and that's me. So thank you so much. Um, I think I have your email, Jen, but if you want to send that to me, um, I can um, add that and contact you directly. Have a wonderful gardening season, everyone. And thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Have a, have a great night. <laughs> Thanks. <sighs>